Does this work? Yeah, oh, there we go, great. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers more generally. And actually, before we get started, I, I just wanna highlight a few excellent people that uh, Dan and I have been working with uh, in and around the IETF. Uh, so there are the other authors of the BLS signatures and hash to curve drafts, and there are plenty of people who have given very careful and very useful feedback. Uh, and if I've forgotten anyone, I'm very sorry. Thank you too. Um, so let's start, I, I, we've seen this a couple times, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll think about it one more time. Wh why are we standardizing things? Um, so one obvious thing is, well, we want to be able to interoperate. So if I tell you I'm going to be using HMAC SHA-256 and I send you a MAC tag, you're going to be able to you know, understand what it means and verify it. Um, and this means that we want to be sort of detail-oriented and precise about you know, how things are specified, but that feels almost like a, like a bother, like a cost. Whereas maybe we should be thinking about this in terms of an opportunity. Like we, we can do careful thinking up front and, and we can make sure that things are secure and efficient um, so that you know, there aren't these problems later. So let's think about a specific example just to, to see the kind of thinking that maybe we wanna do and why maybe those things tend to get missed. So let's think about um, the invalid curve attack. So this was described at Crypto 2000, Bielmeier and Mueller. Um, and so here's some cartoon protocol, right? I'm going to send you an elliptic curve point uh, and you're gonna take your secret scaler, multiply it by the curve point, uh, and send me back the result. Uh, but the problem is your software was badly written, and it doesn't bother to check that the point is on the curve. So the result is that I can sneak a low order point to you, and you will send me back the, 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 your, uh, essentially your scaler, mod some small value, and then since discrete log is easy, mod small values, I'll be able to figure out your point. So if we interact in a, you know, a dozen times, it's game over, I have your, your secret. Um, so, this actually happens for real in things like blind signatures, OPRFs, and actually even in key exchanges, we can get something very close to this. And so the question is something like, okay, why? Why is this happening? Well, uh, there are a couple things that come to mind. So first, when we think about protocols, in general, we tend to think, like, you know, in a crypto paper, we think about mathematical objects, right? I told you I'm sending you an elliptic curve point. But in some sense, that doesn't make any sense, right? What I'm really going to send you is a string of bytes, and then you have to interpret that as a, as a, uh, a point on a curve, right? And that interpretation is prone to error. Why? Well, we have some... In, in some sense, we have some ambient knowledge, right? All around us, there are these attacks, and we know that they're there, but we ignore them because, look, there's only so much room in the background section of the paper, right? So you don't write down every attack. You just say, oh, of course, well, there are other attacks. Okay, but, but when we actually write a standard, we need to sort of distill that ambient knowledge into concrete statements on the page, like check this point, this sort of thing, okay? So this is... Again, maybe this feels like a bother, but actually, um, maybe what we should call it is polite crypto, with apologies to Dijkstra. Um, so the idea is something like this. Look, if I can spend an hour and make sure that you, know, you don't have to you know, read the standard 10 times and uh, maybe go off to 10 other documents, or maybe I save you from writing bad software, that's definitely a worthwhile trade-off, okay? And in some sense, we should regard that as like a statement of, uh, like an optimistic statement, right? Like, of course, 100 people are gonna read this document, or maybe even 1,000, right? And so, of course, it's worthwhile to spend an hour on this, right? So let's, let's be polite in our standards. Okay, and okay, so finally, one, maybe one more reason, maybe this only applies to me, uh, to, to standardize things is we have to be pragmatic about it. And look, I have a tendency, eh, I'm writing software, oh, there's a little knob that I could add, a little dial that I could add that would give us, you know, 2% more efficiency in this case. Well, the problem is every one of these knobs has a correct setting that gives us 2% more efficiency, and then it has 100 incorrect settings that gives us, you know, sort of 100% overhead, right? The users don't want that. They want sort of a, a reasonable set of defaults and, and you know, make some decisions for them. So this is a good thing in the sense that you have to make decisions, but it's a bad thing in that you have to make the right ones. Okay, so that's enough philosophy. So let's talk a little bit about what it is to standardize crypto with the IETF, and then at the end, I'll give you, well, maybe last half, I'll give you sort of specific uh, information about what we're doing uh, with BLS signatures and hash to curve and, and things like this. Okay, so the IETF is sort of this fascinating organization. Um, and I say this sort of as an outsider. It's almost like a, it's like a testament to the power of almost constrained chaos. And that, that's a loving statement. Like, if you go to an IETF meeting, there's something like very impressive about it. There's a lot of work going on. There are people who are excited. Um, and there's just a lot of people who are very good at what they do. Um, so the unofficial motto that they have kind of reflects this. Anyone can go to an IETF meeting and you don't have to be a member or anything. You just go, you show up and you shout into the microphone because you've got a problem and maybe they listen to you, but maybe they don't because not everyone has to agree. It's only rough consensus. And the running code part 
maybe we can interpret it a bit broadly to mean something like this. Look, the stuff is made to be used, so it's our responsibility to make it usable. Okay, so how about crypto? Well, the CFRG is, is sort of the research group within the IETF uh, whose job is to sort of consult on security matters and also to standardize kind of new crypto. And since what we're here to talk about today is advanced crypto, I'm going to ignore like the other routes that you might take to standardizing uh, crypto. So for example, the TLS working group doesn't fall under the CFRG, they do their own thing. Um, but, but, you know, that's sort of more, that, that's not the advanced stuff, so we're going to ignore that. Um, so uh, the standards that the CFRG publishes, well, they're not actually standards. They're called informational RFCs. RFC is request for commentary. Um, RFC 793 is TCP. So like lots of things are RF RFCs. Um, and informational ones aren't standards per se, but things like TLS can incorporate informational RFCs. Uh, into you know the document. So for example, uh, the Curve 25519 RFC is incorporated into TLS 1.3. It's an official thing, even though it's only an informational RFC. So you know don't don't be disheartened. You should write informational RFCs. And finally, um, a lot of the business in the CFRG is transacted on the mailing list. Um, you know, if you have fond memories of like the, the, the news group PsyCrypt from 25 years ago, then this will be very familiar, except probably they're a bit more polite on the CFRG mailing list than they were on PsyCrypt. Um, so it's a good first step to, you know, jump on in and, and sort of acculturate yourself on the mailing list and get an idea of uh, how things are going. Okay, so what is it like to write a draft? Well, the official process is documented in um, an RFC. <laughs> uh, and uh, for, for research groups like the CFRG, basically there are four steps written in the official document. Prepare a draft, uh, review it uh, a few times, and then publish it. And so like, really the CFRG is responsible for the technical content. The IRTF is sort of there to make sure that competent implementers who aren't er experts in the area can parse the document. The IESG is there to make sure you're not stepping on any toes. So for example, if you really want to you know, standardize a new kind of DNS, the, the CFRG isn't the right place for that. And so the IESG is going to tell you no. Uh, and then finally, the RFC editor is doing copy editing. They do an excellent job, but they're very, hard, uh, very overworked. Uh, so be nice to them, please. Um, OK, that's the official view of the world. But it, all of the work that you will do if you write a standard is hidden in step one. So let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so the first thing that you should do if you're going to standardize something at the IETF is make sure you should be standardizing something at the IETF. In particular, like identify some people who actually want to use the thing that you want to standardize and talk to them about it. Also talk to the CFRG chairs, maybe other people in the CFRG, and kind of get an idea. Look, there's a consensus that we need this thing and that we should be, the, we should be writing down a standard for it. So once you've got that idea in, in your head, then it's time to write an individual draft. So this is like the first draft of the standard. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not going to be perfect. That's okay. It can have to-dos spread all over the place. Totally fine. The idea is to give people a notion of what it's going to eventually look like um, so that now people on the CFRG and, you know, your users that you've identified can give you feedback. Like, well, what we really need is this other functionality that, that's not covered here. That's the kind of feedback you want. Once you've gotten to the point where, oh, I should mention before I continue, um, when you write an RFC, the the official format is this horrific XML thing. You don't want to write that by hand. It's, it's a total nightmare. Um, the, the workflow probably will feel a little primitive if you're coming from tech, but uh, you know, it's getting better. Nowadays, you can use Markdown and sort of automatically transform things. Uh, there, there's a GitHub workflow. I totally recommend that because it's really nice to be able to get you know, feedback from people via issues and pull requests and this sort of thing. Um, OK, so now we have an individual draft. People are basically OK with it, so it's time to call for adoption. So now the CFRG says, yes, this is a thing that we're going to work on sort of as a group. And at this point, it becomes a working document in the CFRG. Um, and people on the mailing list are going to you know, volunteer to read your document, uh, to, to give you feedback, that sort of thing. OK, so now at this point, this is where you're really going to the, get the document in shape. So you're going to edit it. Uh, you're going to implement, most likely, a reference implementation of it. Um, and y probably you'll go to at least one IETF meeting and give a presentation. They're short, five or ten minutes. There's a lot of interaction. People come up to the microphone. Y you know, it's kind of a fun, interesting atmosphere. Um, this is where all the work is getting done. Um, and so it's, it's kind of nice to go. Um, at, at some point, you're going to say, look, this is it. We're done. Um, then there will be a last call, which is sort of a speak now or forever hold your peace. Once that's done, then we, you know, we go to those other steps that, you know, that, that were in the last slide, so the IRTF, et cetera. Okay, so how long does all this take? Well, 
Um, an example is the Curve 2559 RFC, which took about a year end to end. So from the first individual draft that got uploaded to RFC editor releasing the document was, you know, I don't know, within 30 days of one year. Um, and there were, in that time, there were about 12 drafts. Um, and most of them were small edits, but you know, there was sort of a, a bunch of editing process going on. Um, and if you look in the datatracker.ietf.org, they give you sort of all the information about the history of documents. And so what's interesting here is um, IRTF and IESG basically take zero time. And the reason for this is they're, they're, they don't just happen sort of in series. The, everyone is sort of paying attention to documents as they go through the process. And so you'll already have gotten some feedback from, you know, for example, if you're trying to standardize DNS under the CFRG. Um, the RFC editor queue, unfortunately, it takes a little while. That, that's because, like I said, they're a little overworked. Um, but you know, they do very high quality work, so uh, work with them. Um, so the drafts that we're working on, uh, BLS and hash to curve, BLS has been in progress for about six months. Um, hash to curve is more like a year and a half. Uh, we'll see why, I think, a little bit later, but the, the, the high level reason is uh, hash to curve is more like a toolbox than a, than a protocol, and the result is, you know, we get pulled in a lot of different directions. Okay, so I wanna jump into these two standards, but first there's one more, maybe slightly unpleasant thing to talk about, and that's patents. Um, so you might guess uh, that there's an RFC for that, and there is, um, and here's the idea. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna standardize something with the IETF and you own a patent on it or your employer does, then you must disclose that. Um, if you know of a patent, uh, but you don't own it, Still, it would be nice if you disclosed it, though you're not formally required to. Uh, and so once, once any kind of uh, intellectual property issues have been identified, um, the CFRG chairs and the IETF administration will go to the company that owns the patents, and they'll say, hey, can you please promise that anyone who implements the standard will you know, have some fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms uh, under which the, they'll be licensed? Um, the problem with this, I mean, that's, that's great, um, but there is this issue that I'm nothing like a patent lawyer, but my understanding is that the words fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory can be interpreted very broadly. And so understandably, there's a lot of uh, you know, trepidation when something that's patented gets standardized. And as a result, um, basically the IETF security area, that's not the CFRG, that's things like the TLS working group and the IPSEC working group, they have essentially uh, a policy that they won't require anyone to implement things that are encumbered by royalties. So if I have to pay a royalty to implement this thing, it will at best be optional. Um, there are other ways that, you, that even if it's patented, maybe it's okay. So uh, reasonable and non-discriminatory with zero licensing, RAND Z, uh, that's okay. Um, even better is if the owner sort of says, we promise we won't patent. Um, but really, uh, from everyone's perspective, in terms of standardizing, um, the, the best ones are the ones that don't have any patents associated. So in short, um, if you want your work to be used, it probably it's best not to patent it uh, because people will be nervous and, you know, rightfully so. Even if right now everyone is happy with the, you know, with the way that the patents are, are being treated, you know, in five years they can get to sold to somebody who will act very differently. Okay, so. Let's take a, a deeper look at the specific stuff that we've been working on with BLS signatures and hash to curve. And I'm just gonna sort of review the technical content, but then uh, along the way sort of point out little things where you know, the stuff that you write in section two differs from the stuff that you write in uh, the standard. Okay, so um, the BLS signatures draft um, is, you know, it's one document and it needs pairing friendly curves. So it's going to rely on a separate document that, def that defines pairing friendly curves and that's also currently being worked on. Um, it also relies on hashing to curves. So it depends on that document. And in fact, hash to curve defines hashes to pairing friendly curves. So it depends on pairing friendly curves. Uh, and then there are a few other documents that I think right now don't actually depend on hash to curve, but at some point in the near future may, um, depend. So you end up, we ended up with these sort of interesting dependency graphs. This is, I would say, not unusual. It's frequently the case that um, documents depend heavily on other RFCs. And that's kind of a good thing. It means you're going to be interacting a lot with those people. And uh, it means that you don't have to, you know, write down everything that, that your protocol needs because probably it's already been standardized somewhere else. Okay, so topologically sorting, we'll start with pairing friendly curves and go from there. So just very generally as a reminder, so pairing friendly curve defines uh, sort of two groups, G1 and G2, both of the same prime order Q that are subgroups of some elliptic curves. Um, and we'll say that we are generators P1 and P2. And then there's a third group, the target group of prime order um, Q as well. 
And of course, there's the pairing operation. Um, so the idea is it's a bilinear map from G1 cross G2 to GT. Um, and you know, very intuitively, what's going on is the bilinear map multiplies the exponents of its arguments. So as we'll see, this is very useful. Um, so this is you know, sort of the background section version of it. But let's think about what else do we need to write down if we're actually going to make a standard for this. Well, presumably, one thing that we want is, we, again, we don't want to be talking about mathematical objects. We want to be talking about bytes on the wire eventually. Um, so we probably need to define serialization and deserialization. And you'll notice that the pairing operation, it takes points in the subgroups, not points on the curve generally. So probably we have to tell people, look, if there's a fast way to do a subgroup check, you're going to have to do subgroup checks. So we may as well standardize the ones that are good or fa and fast, or at least point you to them, right? Um, and probably, maybe this surprisingly, we want to probably put test vectors in the document. And you might say, well, look, it would be even better if we just had a reference implementation. And that's true, and probably you should have a reference implementation. But the reason to put a test vector is, well, if I just, I mean, just imagine you print out the document and you start writing code, and at some point you want to test whether your code is correct, it's nice that you can sort of type in a, you know, a few hundred hex digits and then make sure that your code actually does the right thing. So probably you have to do some spell checking first. Okay, so. That's enough for pairing friendly curves. Let's think about hashing to curves. So the way that we're going to define it in the document is in terms of three primitives. I think you can see that this will kind of fall out nicely. So first, we're going to need some family of hash functions from arbitrary strings to field elements. And we're going to model them as random oracles. Um, second, we're going to need some deterministic map from field elements to points on a curve. And there's been a lot of work on this. And in fact, uh, Dan and I have a paper appearing at Chess next week uh, that makes uh, hashing to lots of curves, including pairing friendly curves, a bit faster. Um, so in particular, we can basically match the cost of alligator, like one square root in the field, for almost any curve. Um, OK, so, uh, so that's map to curve. Um, and of course, for any curve with non-unity cofactor, we're going to want to hash into the prime order subgroup. So probably we want to uh, talk about how to clear the cofactor. And obviously, there's a naive way to do it. But it turns out that, that pairing-friendly curves tend to have very big cofactors. Um, and so in, in a lot of cases, we want to have some, you know, exploit some endomorphism or something like this in order to make the, the cofactor clearing faster. Um, OK, so there's all of that. Now the question is, how do we put, put all this together? And there are some very beautiful results from Breyer et al. and Farshai et al. that show basically for all the maps uh, that I've listed here, um, uh, evaluating the map twice on independent inputs and summing the result is indifferentiable from a random oracle, assuming that the hash to field is modeled as a random oracle. Um, OK, so uh, this is, again, sort of background section. Uh, I'm not going to sort of belabor this point about, oh, we need to specify this thing and this thing. But I want to point out something that actually took a surprising amount of thought. So here's the thing. Like I said earlier, this is kind of more like a toolbox than a protocol, right? So um, what we want to do is give people who are actually building protocols on top of hash to curve some, you know, some dials that they can turn. So for example, a lot of people are going to want to say, well, my, uh, you know, my hash function is uh, orthogonal to your hash function, right? So we need to give them some way of doing domain separation. And the, the, the clear, easy way to do that is in the hash to field function. Um, so, but here's the thing. OK, let's think defensively for a second. Protocol X is going to you know, read the document carefully, and they're going to specify a domain separation tag in just the right way, and life is going to be good. Protocol Z, well, they're in a rush. They didn't quite get things all right. And the result is that now their domain separation tag, let's say, is broken. So here's the question. Can we write the document in such a way that even if protocol Z breaks things for themselves, they won't ruin life for protocol X? Right? So this is, you know, the obvious approaches to this are maybe not going to give us that assurance. But we want to have that sort of paranoid, sort of defensive attitude, like not everyone is going to read the document and implement it correctly. Let's make sure that it doesn't break for the people who did. OK, so the details get a little tedious. I won't talk about them anymore. But the high level message is maybe be paranoid a little bit. OK, and, and finally, uh, the topo sort has led us to BLS signatures. So just a quick reminder, um, a public key is a point in one of the groups. Let's say uh, the public key is in G2. Um, and the secret is the dis discrete log of the public key to the base point. Um, and so to sign a message, we're going to hash the message into the opposite group from the public key. So in this case, we're going to hash it into G1. And then we're going to you know, raise it to the, um, you know, to the secret um, exponent value. Um, and then verification checks that the pairing of 
what the hash of the message with the public key is equal to the pairing of the signature with the base point. Uh, and at least maybe I can convince you that, it, that you know, it's, it's correct. Maybe security is another question. Maybe we'll leave that to the paper. Um, but OK, in this, theory, in this theme of pointing out practical issues, so here's one. Um, I've written down keygen as a randomized algorithm which is totally fine if we're just specifying it, but it's pretty bad if we're, talk or, you know, if we're, if we're talking about it, in, again, in section two, that's fine. But in a document, it's probably not so fine because I don't want to have to tell you, for example, how to build a random number generator. So maybe instead, what I should do is make keygen deterministic and have it take in some randomness, and then I specify to you, well, it needs to be 32 bytes, and please make it high quality and see this other document for, uh, you know, for details on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, and, uh, again, this issue, we don't want to talk about points, we want to talk about strings of bytes, so probably we have to rewrite this interface in terms of serialized strings of bytes, deserialize the string of bytes, make sure that it's on the curve, make sure that it's in the correct subgroup, this sort of thing. Okay, but the real reason that people are thinking today about standardizing BLS signatures is because they're aggregatable. Um, and so here's the idea. So to aggregate signatures, um, we, we can sort of you know, squash all the points together into one point. So we take the, let's say, the product of all the signatures, give me a point in G1, and that's the aggregated signature. And then there are kind of two things that I can do with that. First, I can check a, a multi-signature. So that is one, you know, many public keys all signing the same message. Um, and that's, that's kind of fast. What I can do there is I can aggregate all the public keys together and then do, use the verification equation. Um, and the other approach is, is maybe we can think about it as a batch signature. So in this case, we have one aggregated signature, um, but we have a bunch of different messages and public keys paired together, and we want to check that sort of the, the aggregated signature corresponds to all of the message public key pairs. Um, and there, well, it's a little more expensive because now I have to do sort of n pairing operations rather than um, n point additions, but um, so it still saves us kind of a factor of two in, in terms of computation over the naive approach, and also it squashes the signature down. Okay, but so um, here's a question. Is this secure? Um, and uh, no, <laughs> I'll give you a, uh, yeah, no. Um, uh, so there's this nice uh, idea called a rogue key attack. Um, so let's, let's imagine that Alice has some public key and Bob has some public key, and then Mallory comes along and, and creates a public key that's specifically designed to allow him to uh, forge signatures that look like they're from Alice, Bob, and Mallory. Okay, so in particular, he's gonna engineer his key so that it kind of cancels out Alice's and Bob's key. And then um, if we go back to the, the, the multi-signature verification uh, equation, what we see is, look, as long as Mallory can sort of cancel out Alice's and Bob's keys, then he can forge a multi-signature for any message. Okay, so how do we defend against this? Well, there are kind of four, uh, four ways of doing it in the literature. Um, one is that we, can re we, we require all messages to be uh, unique. Um, the downside there is, well, we can't do a multi-signature verification anymore, so verification gets a little, maybe a little slower because we, we can only sort of get the batch improvement. Um, another approach is message augmentation. So here we, we just prepend the public key to the message before signing, which essentially you can think about that as ensuring uniqueness, but once again, we lose the multi-signature thing. Um, one way, one way that we can keep the multi-signatures is using what are called proofs of possession. So here, we ask the, the, everyone who generates a public key to also prove that they know the secret corresponding to it. How? Well, they just sign their public key. And intuitively, what it, what's going on is now, if you've engineered a key to cancel out someone else's key, well, unless you've broken their key, you, can't, you don't know the secret corresponding to your own claimed key. Um, so now, this is a little complicated, right, because it means you have to generate proofs of possession and I have to verify them, but the, the signatures are deterministic, so you only have to generate the proof of possession once, um, and obviously I can sort of cache my decisions, right? If I've checked your key before, I don't have to check it again. Uh, and finally, there's um, sort of the, the most recent uh, work in this area is uh, using sort of a random linear combination of the keys and the signatures. And the idea here is, uh, you know, even if the messages are the same, we can sort of orthogonalize the signatures uh, to make sure that there's none of this uh, sort of rogue key issue. Um, so this ends up requiring uh, sort of a, a multi-exponentiation to do the aggregation, which is maybe a, a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, but, uh, but the advantage is that we sort of recover, without proofs of possession, we recover sort of the sort of only one pairing in order to check a signature. So in the standard right now, um, we're going to standardize, it seems like we're going to standardize the first three of these. And you might say, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. 
Because, look, message augmentation already gives you unique messages. Why do you need to have the unique messages one and the message augmentation one? And the answer is, again, because we're being paranoid. So here's the, here's the worry. Somebody is going to look at the standard and say, eh, message augmentation seems like a problem. Proof of possession seems like a problem. OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pretend that I'm using proof of possession, but I'm not actually going to generate any proofs of possession. OK, so what we don't want is for somebody who is honestly and correctly using proofs of possession um, to get confused and interpret those signatures as actual correct proof of possession signatures. So we have a, sort of a, a domain separation between the unique message and the proof of possession case, and actually among all three. And that way, at least we build a fire, firewall between the people who sort of maybe may or may not do things right and the people who really, we hope, are doing things right. OK, so I think I'm, I'm running out of time, so uh, let's briefly recap. So um, I, I've, I've hit this over and over again, but uh, it's worthwhile to think about um, making things hard to break, but also it's worthwhile to assume that people will break them anyway, so maybe build in some extra firewalls here and there. Um, uh, implement. Implement your stuff. Um, if other people are going to implement your standard, uh, probably you should be your own first customer because certainly if you can't understand it, then they won't either. Um, so it's nice to implement and give people at least a reference implementation. Um, and what I've sort of be become, what I've sort of realized more and more as I've interacted with, um, with folks is any decision that you make is going to make someone unhappy, right? Somebody's going to want that last 3% of performance, or somebody's going to say, ah, you're crazy. There's a much better way of writing this down. You can't take it personally, but certainly you can take their feedback and say thank you for the parts of it that are useful. And finally, I hope I've uh, convinced you that maybe the IETF is kind of a pretty cool place to standardize your crypto. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take, more, uh, qu to take questions now or to talk about that more offline. Uh, so 